hello. Thank you everyone for being here for tonight's screening of Las Sandinistas. Uh, my name is Bianca Ballina and I am, it is my pleasure to welcome Jenny Murray. She's the director, producer, and editor of the documentary. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. A round of applause. Thanks, guys. <laughs> wow. Must Jenny, be film students. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jenny's a graduate of Columbia University where she studied film, Latin American history, and photography. This is her directorial, the feature directorial debut in the documentary premiered at South by Southwest in yeah. 2018, where mm -hmm. it won a special jury recognition award. I hope you enjoyed it. So we're, we're going to have some time for audience questions at the end, but I thought I'd get us started. And I wanted to begin really just learning how you started this documentary and why you decided to make this film. Yeah, and thank you very much. Thank you all for having me so much. I want to say that. Um, and for everyone who stayed tonight and came out, you know, on a cold winter night. <laughs> no, but really, I live here, and it means a lot to me um, to come out and support a nonfiction film. Just showing up is really supporting uh, this medium, and it means a great deal to me to be here. So thank you. Um, uh, I came to this story in maybe an unusual way. I mean, you know, I'm an Irish girl from Chicago, so I'm not Nicaraguan. <laughs> um, and I was researching uh, basically one night. Um, you know, I, I didn't go to film school. My family, we really couldn't afford that. It seemed, you know, kind of an expensive thing to do, and mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to go into debt. And, um, you know, my dad had died very suddenly, and I was working in finance, believe it or not. Um, after undergrad, and yeah, I, I was, I had made uh, two short films at night, so I was working full time, I actually had two jobs, uh, and yeah, I would make short films when I could, and I was researching, and I wanted to do a feature film, but I wanted it to be something I really, really believed in, um, because I knew, you know, my, my efforts would be, at best, really first time efforts, uh, and I, I didn't have the, you know, the background of film school, so, I wanted it to be a story that I fully believed in and that, you know, the, the subjects would be able to really carry the film. And I was, you know, a friend of mine was living on the border of Nicaragua and Costa Rica and working there. And it just so happened that I had time to travel. Um, and so, yeah, we used miles and I, I flew down and I would emailed some of these women. They didn't write back. And I was researching one night, and this is 2013 that I started researching about this. And... I found an inter interview with uh, Sofia Montenegro, who was this amazing uh, figure in the film, who is a journalist. And uh, she, she was writing and kind of doing work as an activist against the federal abortion ban mm -hmm. and organizing women there. And just the way she spoke was so electrifying. And she, she spoke about all these other women that she'd met and her work in the revolution as a young woman. And it just moved me so much, you know, and this is, it's, it's crazy to think how much has happened in our own country since 2013, right? When we think about our political landscape now, um, you know, but at that time I was really tired of, you know, kind of talking about changing things and really not knowing how to do it. And I was very interested in political change. Mm -hmm. And I had friends at, at Columbia at, at undergrad that were really well acquainted with the Sandinistas and we didn't study that much of it um, in Latin American history that I took, but I was interested, I was interested enough. So on my own, I started researching really on Wikipedia and all these other sites. And I was like, these women are incredible. Soon I bought all the books that I could find. And yeah, you know, I, I grew up in a family that struggled with, with medical and, and student debt and, you know, all kinds of things. And I, I was really interested in alternative systems, you know, mm -hmm. and, and political reform and social reform. And uh, yeah, and this seemed to me that the stories were of such great importance, especially as a woman, especially as a woman, you know, trying to find, I worked, you know, in an industry in finance with, I was on a stock trading desk, so I was the only woman. My mom started a company, so I watched her struggle, and she died very young. Um, and so for me, I think the movie was about so many things. I mean, it combined so many things for me. As you can probably see in this movie, that's 90 minutes, you know. I mean, these women eliminated Miss Universe contests <laughs> for a brief period of time, you know. I mean... And Samosa seems so much like Trump now, you know, and looking at it now and seeing Bernie Sanders emerge, I mean, it's just, the movie's only become to me more and more relevant, you know, since 2013, all these themes. So, yeah, so that's how I sort of started to approach it. Um, 
And then soon I found, once the women agreed to talk, after like six months, that, yeah, that I thought the stories were just so valuable. And no one there was making the film. You know, I talked to all the filmmakers in Nicaragua that I could meet and reached out to on social media and, and when I was in the country connected with. And yeah, it seemed like stories that people, some people knew, some people didn't, but it wasn't a, a film anyone wanted to make at that moment. Um, and I thought the stories were so important. They really seem so, so important to me for the world. And these women, a lot of them were getting older. Some had died already. And so it, it just seemed, you know, that, that the time was right. And who was the first person you spoke with? Uh, Sophia actually oh, yeah. was the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Sophia was the first one. And then, and then Dora Maria and Leah Guido. Oh. Yeah. Leah was um, the health minister who you saw briefly in the earthquake. She was the one who gets up. That yeah. was our second or third day of shooting, was the earthquake. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. They're very common in Nicaragua. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious about how then you get and you start connecting with Eden Pastora, who's obviously a very controversial figure, uh -huh. um, and then was, well, Commander Ciro. But after the revolution, he joined forces with the Contras and actually fought against the Sandinistas in the south of Nicaragua, and um, later, uh, he ran for president a couple times. He's been swinging from one side to another for many years and is <sighs> mm -hmm. apparently now wearing white outfits and driving a <laughs> convertible. So, mm -hmm. yeah, how did you get to talk to him? I didn't, you know, we really reached out to every, I wanted to talk with everyone that had been a part of the revolution. And, of course, many wouldn't talk. So, most of the current Sandinistas, anyone with a high-ranking current position in the government, would not speak. I think that's a really important thing um, to note about the film. So Rosario Murillo, we tried, and, and <laughs> you know, Danielle Ortega, obviously, and, and a lot of ministers. I mean, there were women at the time, like Leticia Herrera, who was a Supreme Court justice, who had been a com like a comandante, mm -hmm. and a number of others, Doris Diarino and mm -hmm. Gladys Baez, and they, they wouldn't say no. They would just sort of ignore us. But we, we would talk to their families, we would talk to, you know, within reason, you know, um, yeah, and basically they, they wouldn't say no because even that's an answer. They were instructed, I think, um, to ask permission internally and then avoid. So, uh, Eden somehow was one of the only ones that said yes. <laughs> I mean, I was very grateful uh, for the interview and actually it was very fascinating. And, you know, I think Eden is such an interesting, you know, to see him compared to someone like Dora Maria and how they recollect. You know, in the way, I felt like it was such an interesting male-female uh, set of differences, you know, okay. in, in, even in the archives, the way they inhabit space and the way, the way he, he talks about his own history, the amount of paintings of himself in his <laughs> office. Um, it was really interesting. And, and also, he was very funny. He loved being on camera. You know, he took us everywhere with it. You know, he'd, he'd bring us everywhere we wanted to go, you know. And a lot of the women were like, come on, you guys, can you, you know. <laughs> um, and he really wanted it. He loved it. Um, so Maybe has less to do, right, in the current moment. Yeah, and we <laughs> thought it was important. I think also I should say that we thought it was important to have some members of the current government, you know, people that were still involved. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want it to only be one side of the current, um, you know, the current political situation. Yeah, and so, and I want to get to the ending of the documentary um, before we keep going. Um, you talk about the kind of unrest, the political unrest that began in April of 2018, uh, which of course then was met with significant uh, repression from the government, uh, and the protests lasted for all of 2018 to 2019. There were approximately 350 deaths that are attributed to the police or uh, forces aligned with the Sandin Ortega Murillo government, 700 political prisoners, and there's about 65,000 Nicaraguans right now in exile because of the violence and repression. Uh, so how did this, uh, these events line up with mm -hmm. the, your process of making the film? Yeah, and thank you for bringing that up, Bianca. That's yeah. so important. Um, yeah, I never would have imagined what was not only going on in our country now, you know, or in 2018 even, during the film's release, but in Nicaragua. We premiered it in March 2018, and then in April 2018. You know, uh, people say it was tour bus or like mobs that were essentially paid or snipers by the Sandinista government. 
um, on buildings or in the crowds shooting at civilian protesters, uh, largely students and uh, retire, you know, retirees mm -hmm. uh, that were protesting for their pensions because Ortega had made a, an announcement that they were going to cut pensions for all these people who had worked. You know, these are tiny amounts of money uh, that people are living on, and that makes the difference, you know, often between eating, yeah. you know, an extra meal or not. So they took to the streets and then they were gunned down. So within a few months, it was over 300 were killed. Uh, and that's a month after we first showed the cut of the film. So then I went back into the edit room. Um, yeah, and you know, we didn't really have, you know, this was made completely independently. Um, so we didn't have any financing. Uh, I, I made it with all the savings that I had and largely edited by the end. You know, I was the main editor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we were very lucky ITVS came on board once we had a rough cut, which is a PBS affiliate. Um, we had applied twice with trailers and with all these packets, and we were rejected twice. And the third time, when they saw the, the rough cut, they said, okay. Um, which goes to show you, you know, you never know. <laughs> and so then we had some funding, but they won't, would not fund feature work. They would only fund the television broadcast work. Mm -hmm. So festivals and distribution into theaters, if you're ever lucky enough to have that, you're on your own, you know. And um, so I, I, you know, knowing that, I was like, well, there's, what's going on there is so important. We do need to change the entire text. You know, we need to change the credits. We need to change, you know, how things are, are phrased. And we made a Spanish version. So basically, I translated it and had some, some friends who speak much, much better Spanish than me um, check and recheck um, subtitles so we could do a Spanish version and show that in Central America and pay to do that as well because I thought it was very important to bring it back there. Um, yeah, so, so in the aftermath, and then in the Spanish version, we have much more, m many more details as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the, the postscript and some of the footage. Uh, so, yeah, so that was the kind of journey since then, and, you know, because of all the protests and deaths. Um, yeah, so we've done a lot of events here to also raise money for a group called um, Amigos de Nicaragua, like uh, mm -hmm. Azui Blanco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we showed the film here a few times in a few places um, to try to support and to, to raise awareness about it here as well. Okay. And have you been able to show the documentary in Nicaragua? No. And we tried one, we, I tried one um, strategy, which was befriending doctors in small towns. These doctors uh, were gonna try to show it in their clinics because it's basically anyone, we were gonna show it and then the people got basically put on this witch hunt list, mm -hmm. the ones that were gonna show it. And then they stopped responding and they were out of the country for many months. And then they came back and wanted to, but it was dicey. And then you're like, well, it's putting them at risk of being imprisoned or killed, possibly, just to show this thing, which is obviously you know, taking a critical look at the current situation. So yeah, I, I'm certainly not in a position to want to put anyone in that. Or anyone who would come to see it you know, could get in a lot of trouble. So yeah, we do hope to show it there soon. I have hope that we will be able to. And so we showed it in Costa Rica, which is very, you know, obviously there's, I think there's over 50,000 exiles there. Yeah, I think that's where most people have been going. Yeah, and, and it did really well. Like, luckily, people actually came out to see it there, which was really moving. And, um, you know, people had a lot to say about it. Uh, so, yeah, I do look forward to that. I think it's going to be incredible okay. to bring it back. Be and, great. Yeah. yeah. And so, I, well, it's interesting to hear that you made that, the Spanish version, because one of the things I was wondering mm -hmm. is what kind of audience you had in mind mm -hmm. when you began or, and ended this process. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't really, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, are there film students here? Is anyone in film? I mean, yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to know who, if anyone will ever like anything that you make, you know? And I was like, well, you know, I, I can't say I'm skilled enough to know that anyone will see it, but. Um, I hoped that at least, I mean, I, I was the audience, you know, on some level, like people who are politically active, people who care about uh, stories of, I think, war, U.S. intervention, uh, political activism, Latin America. Um, I hope Central Americans would be interested in seeing it or, um, you know, Americans who are descendants of Central Americans. Um, and, you know, I really thought, and you know, I have a lot of friends um, you know, women that identify as, as, you know, Latin American who really love it um, and who really responded to it. So that meant a lot to me. Um, I'm not saying that's everywhere, it's just a few people that I know. So that meant a lot to me. Um, and a, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's, great, it's something that's great to see. And 
mean, I grew up in Nicaragua, and so it's the kinds of stories that you grow up with, um, but that aren't necessarily represented when you, e even in Nicaragua, but especially when you go outside, and it was such a significant moment for sure. Um, <laughs> and what has happened since then com really complicates this history so much in ways that, I mean, as Sophia makes it clear, like th this affects families, and th this is something that divides families, and that creates mm -hmm. that tension then there, and you experience this process in very intimate and very personal ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And so I hope that it would, I hope that it would be able to play in Nicaragua, and I hoped it would be able to, you know, screen here. Yeah. You know, so I wanted it to be in English and Spanish because I also knew in, in America, if you if you want anyone to see it, if you want anyone to watch it, it's so hard if there's no English. And it's a sad reality, I think. But a, people really don't like reading. <laughs> like, <laughs> at least that's what the feedback, you know, when we're trying to find broadcasters or people to help uh, yeah. create it. So I hoped if it was in both languages, you know, multilingual, that perhaps we'd be able to reach more people. Yeah. So... Well, and mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you more about then how your position as a U.S. filmmaker informed the way you're mm -hmm. telling this story. I mean, obviously we saw um, the United States was the main supporter of the Somoza dictatorship and later the Contra War. And one of the things I was mentioning earlier is hard to describe the kind of effect that the Contra War had in Nicaragua and the kinds of human rights violations that just became part of everyday life, especially in the north where I'm from, where it borders with Honduras. So, and it's something that can create a lot of resentment, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I mean, judging by the reactions to Reagan that I saw, <laughs> that I heard, <laughs> clearly there's a lot of animosity again with him too. Mm -hmm. So how was that for you? Yeah, it's, it's complicated, you know? And then I, had, I knew that it would be complicated. I, I don't think I imagined how complicated it would be, you know? But I thought the stories were more important, you know, and that it was worth trying my best to make it in spite of the complications rather than not have a film made about it, you know, uh, and the chance of those women dying before some of the stories got to be recorded. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and as, as a, America, a North American, um, I guess I was, I was very conscious of the intervention, right, the legacy of U.S. intervention there. And that was of great importance to me because I don't really see that many films about that, mm -hmm. including war films. I feel like it's, it's rare how, how the framing looks. And, you know, if you go into Nicaragua, like, we go into the countryside and, you know, farmers would talk to you about the CIA, you know. These are people that, that learned to read in the revolution or, or taught literacy in the revolution, and they knew so much about our history, and yet I feel like so few of us, you know, so many people when I made it thought I was making an African documentary. You know what I mean? Because, and it's so interesting that we play such a big role in the whole lives of a generation there, and yet we almost don't know about anything about a lot of Nicaraguans or their history. So, so that was really important to me to show the intersectionality also, you know, how Reagan has, and someone like Bernie Sanders who's still, you know, he kind of looks the same, which is amazing, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's like 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, and he's saying similar things. Uh, and then you have people like, you know, Garcia Marquez or, or Cortazar or Richard Gere, you know, it's like these very, it's kind of amalgam of all these cultural figures yeah. um, from many, many different places. Uh, so that was important to me to show them the international aspects of it, you know, that it was this big thing that the world looked at. You know, you see all these journalists there from all these different countries interviewing Somoza, well, there's like a CIA guy watching, you know, all these bizarre moments, you know, and Reagan obsessing about it, just obsessing. We had so much Reagan stuff, I ended up cutting a lot of the US stuff, you know, because really at the end of the day, it was a story about women and about women's yeah. lives. You know, and, and so anything that, anytime we were going to veer out of that, I, I was very conscious, and especially after test screenings, you feel that in the rooms. Yeah. You know, anytime we left the women's lives uh, and, you know, you know the, the reality that they were facing from their perspective, you'd lose, you'd lose something. Because that's not, the film wasn't about Ronald Reagan. It's not about, you know, some white guys in the U.S. Yeah. There, there are contexts, sadly, for a lot of the things that happened to these women and the, a lot of the actions the women took. Um, yeah, so I want to ask that how mm -hmm. you, because oftentimes as you're sharing the experiences of these women, you kind of have to zoom out to contextualize the mm -hmm. broader history of the revolution mm -hmm. and, you know, just 
the 44 years of the Somoza dictatorship and then what came after. Mm -hmm. So how did you go about trying to balance the more specific thematic needs of the documentary with that process of contextualization? Yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> it was back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Um, we tried, you know, at one point, I think I had a, like a 20 minute in intro about Sandino and about the Marines in the 30s. <laughs> and it was like people literally got up and left the screening. I was like, OK. Yeah. So that doesn't work. So, yeah. people, so that's that's not going to grab people. Um, so then it ended up being as little historical context as we possibly could. And so people weren't confused, but they would get bored when there was too much. And if you if someone's really bored, they're not going to stay in the movie, you know, and you can feel it in a room when they get people get really bored. Yeah. Um, but the history to me was so important and elemental. It was like one of the reasons I wanted to make it. So you know, I, some of it had to stay. You know, the stuff about the Contra War I thought was so important because a lot of these women's lives pivot when that comes in a very, you know, dramatic way. Um, you know, when the Contra, you know, we saw women's, women's rights kind of start to deteriorate, you know, in the face of this large threat from the United States under Reagan, they could do what we did here under, Joe Condit called it like 9-11, you know? So all of these kind of authoritarian forces have free reign, you know? In the earthquake aftermath, Somoza did the same thing at the beginning of the film. Yeah. You know, we see that in the U.S. again after 9-11. After you know, it's an excuse for surveillance. It's an excuse for martial law. It's an excuse for more military and essentially cracking down on, on the domestic population. And, you know, sadly, women's rights and all these, like, little movements that were sprouting up yeah. kind of went to the wayside. Yeah, I so. mean, one of the big uh, positions in which women were able to negotiate, like, a political and social activism during the Sandinista government was as mothers. And mm -hmm. with the contract where you have the um, institution of the mandatory military service, mm. which meant that mm -hmm. many mothers would send their kids to school and their, their 15, 16, 18 year old boys would not come back because they would literally be grabbed by the army from school. Mm -hmm. And so that also became, those organizations became a significant force then in rallying against that. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it affected also the way women related to the revolution and the revolutionary government, for sure. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I mean, people really voted the Sandinistas out, you know, yeah. by 1990. And a lot of that was these mothers. I mean, people were tired of losing their children. Yeah. It didn't even matter what side you were on at that point, but they knew that a vote for the Sandinistas, everyone knew, was a vote for war. Yeah. Because no one in Washington would allow the Sandinistas to continue without war. And I really hope, I mean, that was one of the things I hoped for the film, especially if, you know, the younger generations see it, is that... I mean, it's unacceptable in this day and age, for me at least, um, to think about strangling countries economically that don't do what we want politically, mm -hmm. you know, and, and keeping them illiterate and keeping them working at low-paying jobs and, and dehumanizing, you know, entire segments of the population in favor of dictatorships or military right-wing governments, mm -hmm. you know, which we have a history of doing in Latin America. So this movie seemed to combine that reality in a way that was very relatable mm -hmm. uh, to me. Yeah, and, and I think it makes sense also, you know, the, the population, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened with a revolutionary government had you not had a right wing United yeah. States government come in and, and try to crush the population. And the embargo was so important to me, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, it's before you were born, but I can't even imagine, you mm -hmm. know, when you have to queue up just to get a little bit of, you know, a yeah. little bit of food yeah. every day, you're yeah. in a line seen it in action in Cuba a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, that was the only time I've yeah. seen anything like it. Yeah, and so I want to go back to the beginning now where uh, you have Dora Maria Tellez talking about the two phases of memory. Mm -hmm. She talks about the, uh, the process of remembering, but also the erasure of that memory. Mm -hmm. And then you bring that up near the end. Uh, mm -hmm. So why did you decide to bookend the film with this reflection? Yeah. yeah, to me, I think that's such a, an important part of the film. And I didn't realize that at first our DP was much savvier than I was. And, and she, she was helping edit our trailer. And she was like, this line is so incredible. You know? And Dora really, you know, in spite of being this like, military commander, is also this very poetic and thoughtful, very sensitive human being. And uh, yeah, and that was this kind of moment of reflection for her, you know, because she's very good at recounting facts. And um, she had an incredible memory. But this was this idea of erasure. You know, for her, she was talking about her friends that had died also, that you have to erase trauma to keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, and this idea of like the collective trauma, you know, holding it as a society, you know, and that pain kind of weighing people down and, you know, changing the way people think and act or, and choose not to talk about it, you know. And, 
but it seems so, you know, as time went on and I was editing more and more, it was erasure becoming a part of power became a theme and that was something that became more apparent to me. You know, if you're in power, you want to erase everyone that's kind of not, not going along with your narrative, right? Because that's a part of storytelling, that's a part of maintaining a kind of status quo. You know, I think Donald Trump is a really good storyteller on some <laughs> level, right? Because it doesn't matter, he, he, he has this grasp of however you can manipulate the simple narrative. You know, you can kind of maintain this grasp and this mm -hmm. power and erase the inconvenient facts, for example, or truths. And mm -hmm. yeah, and so to me, the erasure of the women was such a big, I mean, Dora Maria, you won't even see in the museums there, you know, and she led the, city, the taking of Leon. In the yeah. Leon Museum, there's nothing. There's not even a photo of her. And she was a teenager. I think. She, was a, yeah. she was a teenager. Yeah. yeah. And it's amazing. And, and not to mention Monica Baltadano, you know, who took Granada and Lea Guido was marching to and, you know, leading the Ministry of Health. You know, you don't mm -hmm. see this incredible legacy. Um, yeah. You know, and it's almost like, you know, General Patton or something. I mean, it's like really the level of like some of the highest U.S. generals would be in our country. Yeah. And... Yeah, mm -hmm. so erasure, I think, is such a part of the Sandinistas and the Ortega government. Yeah. Maintaining that iron grip on, on and power. Talking about erasure, I was very happy to see also the testimony of Olga and Claudia included in the documentary alongside mm. Monica Valtolano and Dora mm. Maria Telles, mm. these more high profile figures mm -hmm. that also came, in many cases, from sort of more middle or upper class households. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. to have working women there showing their participation was mm -hmm. very significant for me. So mm -hmm. how did you go about this process of balancing these yeah. voices? Yeah, it was really important. We interviewed a lot of women um, around the country, basically every woman we could find. We would go to every town that we had time to go to and ask everyone in the town, do you know women who fought? You know, mm -hmm. it's not, not everyone has a computer, as you know, you know, not. And it's yeah. changing, of course, more and more people are on their phones and on WhatsApp and yeah. But still, and especially in the smaller towns and the older folks, you know, a lot of the women that fought are older now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it was a process, you know, and at first, you know, we had one cut that was almost all like rural, you know, Campesina women that, that were, you know, uh, from different backgrounds. And, and then, you know, it was very difficult, I think, when it was just like 40 women to follow the story mm -hmm. because it was, you couldn't really grab a hold of anybody. And, also, it was so important to me that women had risen to the highest heights, you know, and not, not every rural woman did. Dora Maria did, and, you know, it wasn't many, but it, it was a significant few that we had access to. So I thought it was very important to tell their stories, you know. And in 90 minutes, you know, how do you tell a lot of stories? So, mm -hmm. so I felt like it was important somehow, like Claudia, I think, you know, she, she was a, a farmer, or Olga was a teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, to include those voices, even though they weren't, for example, generals or from you know upper middle class households. Um, but yeah, it was a mix, you know, and you know it's a documentary, so it's you always have to kind of strike that balance. Yeah. Um, so it was important to me to mix as much as I could. But if we if we threw out every woman, you know, that came from an upper middle class or upper class background, then you lose you do lose something too. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, so we tried our best, and it, Claudia's stories just came through to us every time. Yeah, you know, and yeah. Yeah, and I want to talk for a little bit about who I think is the break breakout star of this documentary, and that's Claudia's granddaughter. <laughs> uh, yeah. She's amazing, and yeah. um, and I think I feel like she's like fourteen now. It's so weird. Yeah, because <laughs> I feel like in my mind she'll always be five, you know. But she's like she's growing she's up great. now. Yeah. So how did she yeah. end up being there? I mean. I'm very familiar with how you end up being there as a mm -hmm. kid and mm -hmm. that process of, I mean, seeing her sitting there, just as her grandmother is hearing these like stories mm -hmm. of the war and you're just like, oh, again, here we go again. Grandma's <laughs> telling stories about the war again. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, so something mm -hmm. that I've definitely found very familiar, but mm -hmm. I also loved seeing her there and then at the end when she speaks about why she thinks her grandmother is brave and... Mm -hmm. All that. So how, how did she end up there? Why did you decide to keep her there? Yeah, it was kind of a decision, you know, because she had some chairs set out. And then I think it was actually uh, my DP, Laura, and I were talking about it. And, you know, her kids, she was, you know, they, were, they wouldn't leave her alone, you know, because she was like such a big part of their lives. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they were so interested, you know, they were kind of, at first they were like hiding when we started interviewing her, like under the chairs and stuff. <laughs> and we were like, why don't we, 
you know, it'd be interesting to see the generational, you know, Brichelle was old enough and what we asked her, are you comfortable? Like, is she, are these stories okay? Because we didn't really know what she would tell us mm -hmm. either. You know, you don't really know what someone will start telling you on camera necessarily. And she really opened up. So I asked her and she said she was comfortable and she said she thought it was fine. And, you know, we asked Brichelle if she wanted to sit there, but then she got bored. So she'd get up and leave whenever <laughs> she wanted and come back. And, yeah. and her grandson would come in and out and the cat, the cat <laughs> the comes cat. in and out. Um, and I was like, oh, God, is this a terrible idea in editing? Are we just going to be, are we not going to be able to use? But, you know, it kind of, it, it, you liked yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really, it's one of my favorite interviews. You know, yeah. and I can say it's mostly the DP who, who had the idea to make it as wide as it was. And, oh. um, yeah, credit to her on that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so I really enjoyed the use of archival footage here. And I read mm -hmm. somewhere that you were not allowed to go into the Cinemateca in Nicaragua. And no, you I do see, I think, some um, footage from the Cine films that, mm -hmm. that were made after the revolution. Yeah. So where did you find all this? <laughs> so those came, you know, like we got a lot of footage from like a, a guy who, who really liked a lot of the women in the revolution. You know, he was a big <laughs> supporter of the women and he met us in a parking lot at this mall okay. in Managua. Um, and he like had ripped some of the DVDs secretly, like... Um, oh, from the Cinemateca? Yeah, and not all of them, just a handful that he'd had. And then another professor named Jonathan Buxbaum from mm -hmm. Queens College, mm -hmm. who was this really extraordinary guy who went down... I don't, I don't know if he was there in the late 80s, but he was definitely there in the early 90s. And he wrote a book about the cinema and the Sandinistas um, so I think maybe he was there in the 80s. Uh, and he, he had copies of the noticieros, like mm -hmm. the newsreels about literacy and health, um, you know, that he had on, um, I think they were on DVDs. And then we made digital, digital rips of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was really generous. I mean, my God, some of the people that were so generous, like Susan Mizelis, the famous war photographer, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, she's a consummate artist too, but she, mm -hmm. her photographs are in the film a little bit. She was extremely yeah. generous. She's, because of her, I think, she's the only reason I was able to make the film, really. Because the women didn't trust me. I was some random, you know, white gringa. Mm. They didn't know who I was. Um, but they trusted Susan, because Susan had been there in the revolution and was really someone, a beloved figure, a trusted figure who helped make the... She made it visible. She made it known, yeah. invisible in all these places. And she's still an incredible human being and was very generous with her time with me, in spite of how busy and successful she was. So she, she gave us photos and access yeah, but a lot of that was from, there was also a, a Mexican cinema, like a, he was, I guess it was a, actually a Nicaraguan DP and then a director who was Mexican, Jorge Denti. Mm -hmm. He had some, he had a film from the revolution, um, but it was on like tape. You know, we had all these kind of interesting processing, <laughs> you know, situations that were very, yeah, a lot of things. I mean, when you think about it, it's a miracle that we got anything. Yeah, and so most of the, your um, archival stuff is from U.S. archives? Okay. Some, the AP, the newscast, yeah. you know, of course. Yeah. So those, I was so lucky because on YouTube, uh, Associated Press had digitized some of those. So I would just sit on YouTube all night long after editing and just like go through everything, like every word, Nicaragua, like Sandinista, um, you know, women or, you know, and then I would search in Spanish over and over uh, for the words. Uh, so thank God for the internet sometimes. Yeah. I mean, thank God. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, and thank God for these filmmakers that are still alive, you know. Yeah. Um, and so and part of the footage that was the, the most infuriating for me was Tomas Borges talking uh -huh. about women, <laughs> women and men's relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and Tomas Borges is the, the found, one of the founders of the Sandinistas. And it's, I mean, it's an infuriating moment for many reasons uh, if you grew up with having him as a figure there. But, yeah, how did... Mm -hmm. You end up finding this, and why did you decide to include that as well as, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. Pastora talking about women looking prettier <laughs> when they're fighting. Yeah, what's amazing is that's all from this one film uh, by a, a woman named Victoria Schultz, a director, mm -hmm. uh, who made this beautiful film called Women in Arms, uh, and she had got it restored and it was preserved at Duart, you know, this New York house and. I think, I believe she was Finnish and American and she lived in France. You know, she's a very interesting person. And that footage, it was a complex licensing process. You know, she, she knew that her footage was of great value, you know, as it, as it is. And we had to raise money before we could get it. So I didn't know if we'd ever be able to license it. Um, thank God ITVS funded the film because that enabled us to, to license that footage. But the, can you imagine, I mean, it's Dora Maria Young, you know, it's, it's this beautiful, I think, 35 millimeter film. 
She had it so beautifully restored and, um, and it's about women. So she's interviewing men at the time, you know, as this woman down in Nicaragua making this film about, you know, Thomas Borges and Pastora about their opinions about women and they just talk so frankly. <laughs> you know, like Thomas Borges says, we're satisfied to keep things as they are. Yeah. We hope things never change between men and women. Yeah. And that's and, it, point blank. And then it's like, oh, but there should be a quality tap, you know. And, <laughs> and that yeah. to me was like, you're like, oh. As someone said, you know, cut, cut before he taps her, one of the editors. And I was like, well, that's, that's all of it, no, you know. Yeah. Because then he just says the line that everyone says who's a feminine, you know. But it's also oh, quality, yeah. da, da, you know. Straight up harassment at some point. I mean, where he's like, oh, when he touches her this, face. Yeah, yeah, clearly uncomfortable. And she looks down. Yeah. yeah, there's so much unspoken in the film. Yeah, definitely. Right? Those moments. Um, and so, I mean, it's, I think, I found this interesting because it encapsulates this thing of like, yes, women can fight and they are equal, but they should also know their place. And this was something. I went back to read um, Che Guevara's guerrilla warfare because I remember he has a section about women and women's participation in the guerrilla movement. Oh, wow, I've never read and that section. pretty much prescribes what one of the women here um, describes is that process of, yes, we will fight, we can fight, but also women do the cooking, the cleaning. And so he described this as like, one of the greatest contributions that a woman can have to the revolutionary process is this. And so this constant process of, yeah, like you can do it, but also you're better at cooking and cleaning and being gentle, I think, is the way he describes it. So it's very, mm -hmm. it's very interesting to see it repeated and reappear in all these contexts. And it's so subtle, right? It comes out so subtly because he'll say like women, you know, Eden will in one breath say women, they fight and die just like a man. And then the other, it's like, and they're much prettier yeah. when yeah. they're fighting. <laughs> And it's yeah. like, how do you, it's, they do coexist, you know? Yeah. They just coexist and we still see that, right? We still see it, yeah. especially as women, I think a lot of us deal with it all the time, you know? And yeah, it's just, it's, I think I love how Dora says, you know, just because you take a step forward doesn't mean that you never go back. Yeah. You know, social changes like swing back and forth like a river. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. And of course the role, I mean, that these women are playing today, and I think she mentions, and you mentioned the role for the fight for abortion rights in Nicaragua, even therapeutic abortion is banned. There have been many cases of 12, 13 year old girls who are forced to have their children or their pregnancies that are come out of uh, rape. So really that's mm -hmm. kind of many steps back that are taken, have been taken, and that have mm -hmm. been promoted by the Ortega Murillo government. Yeah, and even um, in addition, which is smaller seemingly, but the Little Miss Nicaragua contests are back in all the towns, yeah. and um, yeah, and I guess Rosario really promotes the role of the Sacred Mother, the Virgin Mary, and not to mention her own stepdaughter, Zoila America, yeah. who mm -hmm. in Costa Rica we did a double feature um, with a short documentary about Zoila America, mm -hmm. who Rosario, her own mother, exiled to Costa Rica, so she wouldn't, you know, after yeah. she was very vocal about the rape charges against her father, yeah. the president of the country, you know, her stepfather, I should say. Yeah. So, and when that's what's going on with the leaders of the revolution, yeah. you know, in their own homes, you know, it's a very, it's, it's complicated to imagine that they're really leading with any serious revolutionary spirit or sincere ideal. Yeah. I think we are out of time. I want to say thank you once again, again to Jenny for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>